there is some, there's something special uh, about the what would be the phrase heavy metal of the Second World War. The the, the fighters that became to history buffs so familiar uh, over the succeeding decades: uh, Spitfires, Mustangs, the ME109 family, which was one, uh, I guess, with the Spitfire, one of the, the very few fighters to remain in production throughout the entire war. That said, I had been hearing rumors for a year or two that there was an intrepid gentleman in Saskatoon who was who was working on a restoration of a BF-109 fighter. And when I was at the annual aviation days of the uh, Saskatchewan Aviation Museum and Learning Center uh, in Saskatoon at the end of August. I was absolutely delighted to run into Don Bradshaw, who's quarterbacking this restoration, and also to see this aircraft in the flesh as it were. It's really a remarkable project. I am really looking forward to hearing what Don has to say about this journey into aviation history. So I ask you to join with me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Don Bradshaw. Thank you very much. I'm certainly honored to be asked to give a presentation at your meeting. And we can move right into the next slide. There we go. So a little bit about me, uh, born, born and raised in Saskatchewan, uh, licensed aircraft maintenance engineer, both in maintenance and structures. I apprenticed at Corman Air Park and Norcan Air. I worked for Transport Canada with Roger Beebe for 25 years as a civil aviation safety inspector. Um, after I retired from Transport Canada, I went to work for the Saskatchewan Indian Institute of Technology and I established their aircraft maintenance engineer training program and their facility in Saskatoon. And although I never intended on being an instructor, I actually ended up uh, instructing there for six years and I quite enjoyed it. And I'm presently retired for the third time. So I'm trying to make that stick. Um, and I actually, uh, I was born and partially raised in a, a small town about 30 miles from Swift Current. And Swift Current was, after the war, um, a fairly major dispersal point for a lot of the aircraft that were declared surplus. And uh, of course, there were scads of Avro Ansons, uh, Cessna Cranes, the odd Barclay Grow, sorry, not Barclay Grow, Airspeed Oxford. And later on, there was Yale's, Lysander's, and 11 Hurricanes that were surplused out of there. So um, I was born a little late, probably thankful for that now. Um, but a lot of these, uh, you know, uh, aircraft projects had been gathered up by other people by the time I got interested in it. Uh, however, when I was young, uh, you know, a lot of times we'd go to people's birthday parties, especially on farms. And the first thing you did is ask them where their airplane was. And nine times out of 10, they had one. Uh, usually it was an Avro Anson. And by that time, you know, fairly, uh, what, run down and decrepit. But it was still something, you know, fantastic to play on. So I, I guess maybe that was the start of the hook. Next slide, please. So I... Uh, was involved in a few projects. Uh, one of my first one was a Westland Lysander. And I actually got it from, it was surplus out of Swift Current. And I got it from a farm uh, in Harris, Saskatchewan. And the gentleman, uh, Wallace Crawley, had actually purchased two from Crown Assets in Swift Current. And in those days, you had to take them across on the ferry. And so that was a bit of an undertaking. Usually they removed the wings of the Lysanders and just left them at Swift Current. And they would uh, throw the tail wheel of the Lysander over the back of their pickup truck tailgate and drag it home. And he actually had two of them. Uh, interestingly, uh, one he pretty well took all apart. And the other one that was there was probably fairly complete as the one you see in the photo. And that. Um, was donated to the uh, National Museum in Ottawa. 
and uh, a gentleman by the name of Bernie Lapointe uh, was with um, the Air Force at that time in Winnipeg, and he actually um, and other, I guess, members of the team rebuilt the Lysander, and that is the one that's actually in the National Museum now. So I had the brother of it that was fairly disassembled, and so I obtained this, uh, you know, obtained this project and. Uh, Actually, the fuselage structure was all uh, redone and everything. And although I had no intentions of selling it, uh, a gentleman from the British Aerial Museum really, really wanted to get a Lysander uh, for the museum. So, um, you know, in those days, I didn't make much money. And so when, when the number got high enough, I just said yes. Now, as it turns out, interestingly, the Lysander that I have, or I had, um, Many of them were built um, at um, Canada Car and Foundry in Fort William, which is now Thunder Bay, if I'm correct. And uh, they were all built in Canada. When you went to someone's farm and you saw a Lysander, you could look and you would see it built by Canada Car. Interestingly, the one that I ended up with was built um, by Westland in U of Vilton, England. And, um, you know, it didn't mean anything special to me, uh, but I believe it was one of the reasons that the British Aero Museum really wanted. And they uh, subsequently got the aircraft back and finished rebuilding it and got it flying. And uh, since that time, I found out that in fact, it was most likely one of the special ops uh, Lysanders that were used during the war uh, overseas. And so, you know, I guess that's the one that got away. Uh, next slide, please. Also, I got involved uh, with rebuilding a Hawker Hurricane. And uh, so you'll have to excuse the, the visuals. Um, I have them all on still photographs and most of them are packed away. So I just happen to have a few. This is basically in my garage in Saskatoon. And uh, I basically other than a few serviceable structural parts, um, made the structure uh, completely new. And uh, fortunately, the Hawker Hurricane, the way it's constructed is, it ha you, you can put it together in your basement, it's like a big mechanical set. And uh, most of the gussets and stiffeners that you see are all made of stainless steel. So even after all those years, they were still in perfect condition. Next slide, please. And that's what I started with when I got involved in the hurricane project. So there wasn't a lot there. Um, I thought it was everything, but uh, you know, uh, it, I didn't start with a lot. Next slide. And this gentleman, uh, Harry Warrick, down at Assiniboia, is actually where I got that center section of a hurricane from. And Harry was one of the early pioneers that went around to all the various uh, farms and things in Saskatchewan and gathered up unique aircraft and took them back to his shop uh, and his farm in Assiniboia. And uh, I wanted to sort of give a, a little shout out to Harry uh, because he was one of my mentors. And unfortunately, Harry's passed on now, um, but his uh, hurricane uh, is part of the Vintage Wings collection now. Um, in Ontario or Quebec. I'm sorry, I don't know where it is. Next slide. Kermit Weeks. Um, my connection with Kermit Weeks goes back uh, 34 years. And he is actually the gentleman that purchased my Hawker Hurricane project. Um, you know, the, the hurricane got to a point where it needed significant dollars to finish and it was above my pay grade. So, um, at that time, Kermit just happened to be adding uh, a British aircraft wing to his museum. And so he purchased the aircraft. Um, he wanted to purchase it sight unseen, but I wouldn't let him. I said, no, you know, you have to send someone up here, or come up here yourself and look at it because I want you to know what you're getting because I don't want any phone calls later saying, where's this, where's that? So anyway, he actually flew up here and had a look. And we really hit it off. And so that was kind of my connection with Kermit. And uh, he becomes, I guess, more important a little later in this chapter. So I, I took this photo off of his website and I assumed that that was his wife. And it's actually not. It's actually just a, 
a lady who had won a uh, flight in the P-51. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, to this day, I get calls from people and they want to build a warbird, etc. And of course, the warbirds of the Second World War are of particular interest. Um, when I was a young apprentice at Corman Air Park, uh, you, we used to get the trade of plain yellow magazine, and that was like the Bible. We could hardly wait for it to show up. And in there, you could buy a P-51 flying, probably a little ratty, um, for $75,000. And we just thought that was just totally crazy. But, uh, you know, as it turns out, it would have been a, a wise purchase. Anyway, of course, after the, after the war, uh, aircraft were basically smelted down. Um, you know, all of the uh, metals and things that everybody had done without during the war, um, you know, they were anxious to get things sort of back on track. So with all these thousands and thousands of airplanes, they just chopped them up and melted them down. Next slide, please. And this is overseas. Obviously, I would say an occupied country at the time, um, but it used to be fairly easy to find warbird parts because there was mountains of them everywhere. And unlike the First World War, where the Allies allowed Germany to retain some of its munitions uh, for protection of the country, um, you know, even though they had been defeated. And so when we fast forward to the Second World War, when the war was over, they didn't make that mistake the second time. And basically everything in Germany, war-wise, pretty much was destroyed. Next. So this is a, a typical scene at a, I guess, a local airfield in Germany somewhere where a lot of the uh, 109s and other aircraft were just, uh, you know, uh, when the war was over, the pilots basically flew them to these various uh, bases and surrendered and left their airplanes there. So there was lots of parts. Next. Um, with the fall, I guess, of the, you know, the Berlin Wall, etc., there was a whole new picking area that opened up for Warburg restorers. And I can't say for sure that this is in Russia, but it probably was, or the Soviet Union. And uh, a lot of the aircraft, you know, were exactly as they were crashed many years before, because, you know, it was a, it was a fence to, you know, disturb anything that belonged to the government. And so, you know, aircraft projects such as this, which would be an excellent project nowadays, um, were actually sitting in the fields. And they do continue to find them, not as frequently, but they do come up. Next. And this is another shot. Basically, you needed friends in the Russian Air Force, and you could get your machine airlifted out of wherever, um, you know, remote location it may be. And uh, a lot of these ended up on the market. And, uh, you know, they were gobbled up, I guess, by restorers around the world. Next. And another shot. Uh, I don't know the history on this particular project, but that would be what would be considered to be a good start nowadays if you wanted to build a 109. Next. And uh, they find them in lakes. Uh, last year they found one in a lake. And amazingly, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, unlike the Pacific Ocean and all that theater where the aircraft underwater are slowly turning to dust, uh, a lot of these freshwater, cold lakes, um, the aircraft is fairly preserved and in a lot of cases, the paint's still on them. Next. So this, um, this is a, a G6 aircraft. This actually belongs to an acquaintance of mine and this is about a million dollars worth of 109 sitting there right now. And there is actually no engine in it. So, you know, if you had a million dollars, that's what you could get. And that aircraft um, currently is almost done being completely restored. Um, the fuselage, you know, while it looks fairly intact, actually for airworthiness purposes was no good. And so they actually had a new fuselage built in Germany 
and shipped over and uh, you know I guess that's the one that they're using uh, this one was simply too far gone next and another shot of that fuselage when it was being unloaded uh, somewhere and so you know it it looks good from far but I can assure you that it's far from good next and this is be uh, a, what I guess a typical 109 project now there you know it's one of those things and I, I I I have a lot of dreams and I don't like people when they're stomping on my dreams and I run into a lot of people that have Warbird projects and you know usually they're much like you see in this photo where they have boxes of parts and everything. And I mean, it's great. There's a lot of history there and it's, you know, it's fortunate that it's going to be saved, but there is a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of money that has to be spent in order to turn a pile of parts like that into an actual airworthy aircraft. Next. So this is uh, a, a little bit of a, compressed photo of uh, ME-109 G6. Um, the G6 aircraft uh, was the most prolific built 109 and they built uh, around 11,000 of them. And the 109 itself uh, between 1935 and the end of the war in 45, there was approximately 34,000 109s that were constructed. Um, I've had wreckage from earlier 109s and I have wreckage from late 109s and uh, while they generally look the same there are uh, I guess continuous improvements that were done in performance and you know war is kind of like racing you know you don't want to be second best and so they're continuously trying to improve their product give it more firepower make it handle better um, you know, uh, more power and, uh, you know, if you want to come out on top. And so the aircraft was very successful. Um, I certainly haven't flown one and probably never will. Um, but, uh, you know, towards the end of the war, it was a very hot performer. Um, and we'll get into the power plant a little bit further on. So this is basically what Ker Kermit's aircraft, this is not... This is what, generally the markings that it's in, uh, but it's not its original markings. It's uh, basically just like a temporary paint scheme. Next. So if you wanna build an airplane, the first thing you gotta do is build the jig. Now, a lot of people seem to be under the impression that you need a straight aircraft to build a jig from. And you know, my argument for that is, where did the first airplane come from? you had to have a jig to build it in. So, uh, you know, when you study the drawings, uh, there's certain hard points that are very important to have in the right location. And you can design a, a jig structure. So in fact, those particular parts are exactly where they're supposed to be. Next. And so this is one of the first pieces in the, in the jig, which is a new center section main spar assembly. And uh, I basically constructed this from scratch. And, uh, you know, there are a few drawings around. This is a late war version, uh, considerably heavier, heavy, heavily constructed compared to the early war version. But late in the war, they were hanging a lot of things on the wings. Uh, you know, some of the 109s had a 20 millimeter cannon on each wing. And so they had to beef up the primary structure of the aircraft in order to be able to accommodate that. Next. And so, you know, I guess you keep adding parts to the parts that are in the jig. And pretty soon it starts to gain a little shape and look like an airplane. Next. And so a few more parts. Uh, you have to make sure that they're in exactly the right place. Um, you can hang sheet metal like this in a, in a jig fairly quickly. The work comes in when you have to drill it all and deburr it and, you know, acid etch it and prime it and put it there and dimple it and rivet it and, and things like that. So um, it looks like a lot of progress was made, um, but there's actually a tremendous amount of work to actually sort of bring that to fruition. Next. So some more parts in there, that's basically the seat pan. Um, 
and as is sort of the normal way, um, the pilot is basically sitting on top of and in front of uh, 400 liters of avgas. Um, the fuel tanks were typically put very close to the center of gravity of the aircraft so that as the fuel burned, um, it wouldn't change the characteristics of the aircraft too much. And, you know, um, it was a war. Uh, later on, they got into uh, sort of rubber fuel cells and they were somewhat self sealing. Uh, but earlier in the war, I don't think the Germans thought anybody was going to be shooting at them because uh, they were compared, you know, to British and American aircraft, very lightly armored. Uh, later in the war, they got a little more serious about it. Um, but early in the war, not so much. Next. So you keep going and pretty soon you've got a uh, cockpit section of your 109. Next. A uh, few pieces on the inside. There's a lot of testing and fitting that has to take place. In the closing days of the war, the Germans basically destroyed all of the blueprints, et cetera, for the 109 and I'm sure many, many other aircraft. And you spend hours gleaning over photos of aircraft that are in museums and things like that, trying to find out where some of the bits and pieces go, what the rivet spacing is, et cetera. Now, the, the, the Spanish, um, during the war, Spain was actually on Germany's side for a while. And so they were going to build the 109 under license in Spain. And so that was actually beginning to take place. And what the Germans did is they sent them 25 sort of airframe kits uh, and no engines, and uh, it was basically a, a G2 uh, 109 aircraft, and, you know, the idea was that the engines would follow, and, uh, you know, as the war went on a little bit, uh, Germany could spare the engines, so the project just died, and uh, later after the war, actually, Spain uh, built some of the aircraft and actually put various engines in them, um, and they ended up using the Rolls-Royce Merlin, which is kind of ironic. Next. So you keep going and pretty soon you've got yourself, uh, you know, a cockpit section. So uh, you always have to mock up the parts and make sure that everything's in the right place, etc. cetera. And, uh, you know, the construction of the aircraft up to this point is fairly straightforward. Uh, but you know, I guess uh, 109 projects have a lot of challenges and we're just gonna move into that with the next slide. So the rear fuselage, the way that the Germans designed the aircraft is that every second skin has the bulkhead stretched into it. So where typically you would have stringers and bulkheads and then you wrap the skins around and then rivet it, the Germans skipped the one step and they actually formed every second skin with the bulkhead as part of its structure. And so it's, um, uh, there's only two places in the world that make those skins. And uh, you know, they're uh, what, they're not that customer friendly when it comes to value. So it is what it is. If you're gonna build a 109, then you have to step up. And, and fortunately those parts um, are available they're very long lead and very expensive. Uh, but the Germans were very wise about this because what they did is the form skins contained any compound curves that the, in this case, the rear fuselage might have. And so uh, forming a metal, um, I guess with the skins in between the form skins, uh, those were just flat sheets that were rolled. And so it was very straightforward. So basically, um, you've, you've got to come up with a jig that can actually hold these skins in the right locations so that you can align everything and make the skins in between, etc. So it's fairly complicated and it is sort of the Achilles heel of the rebuilding of a 109. Next. So here's a shot of one of the uh, half skins. Um, with the bulkhead stretched into it. And I thought you'd find this interesting, but uh, you know, it's, it's quite a process. And the, the Germans did it really quickly. They had the tooling to do it. They basically had dies. They, 
they stretched the aluminum over and then they formed it around the edge and trimmed it and then they heat treated it. So, uh, uh, you know, they sort of had it down pat. It's a great idea, but it is, you know, a, a definite tripping point for 109 projects. Next. So these are those skins, the left and the right sides, and you can see every second one is missing. And the jig also has to hold the outside of the skins uh, because you need to ensure the transition between the form skins and the flat skins is, you know, well done and in the place it's supposed to be. So uh, that's what these are all about. Next. So this, those forms actually are split in half. So you literally, you know, after you form everything in there, you can slide one half right off and, uh, you know, basically work on the structure. And interestingly enough, the Germans actually built the aircraft in two halves. And then they simply joined the two halves together and someone went inside and did, you know, the, the main stringer on the top and the main stringer on the bottom in the rear fuselage and then everything was put together. And uh, there are a few pictures around and I would imagine that the Germans also put as much of the system components in there as they possibly could before they joined them together um, because it's a tremendously small aircraft. Um, this aircraft, the fuselage fits in my 24 by 24 garage. So it gives you an idea. Now there's no engine on it, um, but it's, it's like a little indie car. People that see it think it's a scale. They think it's like, is that a 50% scale or what is it? But, um, you know, it's, it's full size. It's just a small airplane. Next. And here's those two sides put together. Now, another complicating factor is the stringers have to be next to the skin because you're going to rivet them. So the bulkheads at all the proper locations have to have a hole punched in them and the hole is actually flared for strength, and that's where the stringers lie. And so you have to make sure you get all the stringers in the right place too. And uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a little tense because it's a lot of money and a high lead time if you happen to make a mistake, you know, a fatal error on one of the skins, you basically would have to order another half skin and you're probably looking at a year's delivery time. And, uh, you know, can buy a small car with one half of those skins. So, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty stressful. Next. And here's a picture of when the fuselage is actually going together. So uh, I guess the stringers were being aligned in this, in this picture. So the forms actually hold everything in place. And then the time comes when you have to move the forms out of the way, even temporarily. Uh, so that you can get in there and, and do some stuff. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's a brilliant way to build an airplane. It's not so easy to duplicate when you don't have all the tooling. Next. And here's the fuselage going together. So everything's been, you know, all the rivet spacing and everything, the holes have been drilled. Uh, it's been taken apart. The stringers have been dimpled. The skin has been dimpled. The skin has been scotch brighted acid etched, primed, and now it's going back together. So unless you're a very small person, which I'm not, the fusel rear fuselage has to sort of be put together strategically so that you can actually get in there and buck the rivets. Um, if not, you, you know, you'd have to find some miniature people to go back there. Next. So after all that work, uh, you finally end up with a fuselage. Uh, this is Kermit's G6 fuselage. It's actually on a transportation fixture. Uh, the, the black unit that you see on the front, that is actually the ammo box for the two 13 millimeter machine guns, which are on the deck. And uh, early in the war, the spent casings and links, they just blew them out the bottom, just like every other fighter aircraft did. And, you know, as the war went on, um, you know, uh, raw materials were becoming an issue for the Germans. And so what they actually did is they blocked those doors off 
and they allowed the empty brass and the clips to accumulate in the bottom of the ammo box. That was one of its purpose. And uh, when they got back to base, the armorers would open the doors and dump all the brass and links out and, you know, I guess send it rearward to be reloaded. Next. Um, this is a distorted view of the cockpit of the 109. Now, Kermit's airplane is much more advanced than this. This just happens to be a picture that I thought, you know, kind of showed you a few of the doodads that are going on the inside. Um, surprisingly, instruments, I guess I couldn't say they're easy to get, but they're not that difficult to get. But they also are very popular because there are thousands of people around the world that have a ME109 instrument panel that they want to put instruments in. And so the prices of the instruments are pretty expensive, uh, but it's amazing. Uh, Siemens built most of them and they still come up. Uh, they're cleaning out grandpa's closet and they put the stuff on eBay and there's a brand new horizon in the box, et cetera. So those are the kind of the things that I go after. Um, you know, when the time comes to overhaul them, they should be a little more reasonable to do. But, uh, you know, there are some things that are fairly easy to find. And uh, that hole that's in front of the stick, we'll, uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, that's actually where the cannon sits, and we'll get into that shortly. So next. And this is Kermit's fuselage now. Um, this would be the one that was, was seen in Saskatoon at the museum. And this is just a temporary paint scheme. Um, I was sick of looking at the green. And so I talked him into allowing me to put like a temporary paint scheme on them. So basically all the colors except for the red are actually etch primer. So, you know, it's fairly easy to deal with when you want to paint it a different color and get it all prepped. And I wanted to point out too, is those sort of weird looking things on top of the anode box there. Those are actually the uh, mounts for the two 13 millimeter machine guns. And they are original mounts. They actually came uh, from a cache of parts in California that um, were left over from the rebuild of some German aircraft, you know, I would say probably middle eighties. And, you know, back in those times, I mean, people didn't worry too much about originality. They never even put the machine gun mounts back on. So they just ended up in the corner of a hangar somewhere. And lo and behold, they showed up on eBay. And uh, there was people from all around the world bidding on those. And, you know, ultimately, I got them for Kermit. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of competition for them. Next. Hang on. There we go. And there's, there's a picture of it on the fixture at the uh, museum in Saskatoon. Next. And another picture of the ammo box. Um, you, the, you can see the, the main hydraulic valve there. And there's also, um, you know, the uh, drop tank fuel valve. And, you know, the Germans, they, I'm still amazed almost every day I come across something and I'm, I'm just amazed that back in those days, they actually thought about that. And uh, we're going to cover a few of those unique things. Uh, one thing about the drop tank, um, you know, the 109 having about 400 liters underneath and behind the pilot isn't that much when you're trying to really go somewhere. So they had 300 and 330 liter drop tanks that they would put on the aircraft. And to get the fuel out, um, it's kind of the same as, you know, you have a straw and a drink. And if you cover the top of the cup and you blow into it, it'll come out the straw. Well, that's how the Germans got the fuel out of the drop tanks. They basically uh, piped some of the compressed air off of the supercharger and they blew it into the, into the drop tank and the drop tank would then transfer the fuel. And when it was empty, they just shut the valve and blew the tank off and away they went. Um, if in fact they were gonna get into combat, they would have to drop their, their drop tanks uh, because aerodynamically they weren't that great. But, um, you know, uh, it, was, it was good for them to have the extra fuel. Next. Okay, we're going into the third part. 
So everybody asks, how do they shoot through the spinner? You know, um, and it, it's really not all that complicated. If we go to the next slide. Oh, okay. I guess we're going to talk about armament a little bit. You can see um, the two 13 millimeter machine guns that basically shoot up sort of the top deck over top of the engine. And the Germans electrically timed them so that they would only fire when they were commanded to and to make sure that in fact they didn't shoot the propeller off. And it worked really well. Uh, you know, they got all kinds of timers and different things uh, which do show up new and in good shape uh, once in a while. And you can also just sort of see in the center of the photograph a little bit to the right side there, that's actually the mount to the cannon. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. And this is a side view of the aircraft engine. So it's a V12 and it's inverted. So the cylinders are at the bottom, crankcase is at the top. Uh, what you see in the center there is basically a tube and it lines up with the main output shaft that the propeller is mounted on. So if we go to the next photo, that's where they shoot through in order to, you know, get the main cannon to fire out the center of the spinner. And it was very effective because basically it will shoot any way you've got it pointed. And uh, the G6 has a 20 millimeter cannon. So, you know, 20 millimeters, we're talking about what, three quarters of an inch, pretty big, pretty big shell. And, uh, you know, the Germans came up with this. Um, basically the Spitfire, you know, which didn't have an inverted V12, but it was a V12, could have done the same thing had it been designed to do so. Next. So here's a picture of the 20 millimeter cannon sitting bolted to the back of the engine. So uh, there actually was a mount and it just bolted up tight, wasn't rubber mounted or anything, um, but that's how they mounted the cannon. Next. And here's another shot of the cannon. So basically the cannon hangs off structurally off the back of the engine. And when you install the engine, the cannon actually just inserts right in that hole that we saw in the cockpit and hangs into the cockpit, um, you know, right where the pilot is pretty well. Next. So here's a picture, you can see the rudder pedals there. So if the, if the pilot kind of looks down between their legs and a little bit forward, that's actually the breach of the cannon. And uh, it's mounted to the engine, so the engine's rubber mounted, of course, and so it moves around with the engine. And there is a sheet metal cover that goes over the cannon, um, you know, so when you're flying, you don't uh, get smoked out of there too bad. Although, um, uh, a 109, you pretty well have to be on oxygen at all times when you're flying it because the, the Germans had a different philosophy and the firewall is very porous. And, you know, there would be all kinds of smoke and different things coming back to the cockpit. So I'm pretty sure the pilot would be incapacitated fairly quickly if they weren't on oxygen. Next. And there's the output shaft the propeller shaft of the engine, and you can see that it's hollow. And so that's where the cannon fired. Next. And I tried to include this photo to try and give you a feel of exactly how big the engine is. When you see the little dinky fuselage and the wings, you know, basically from the wing root to uh, not including the actual bolt-on wing tip, the wing's 12 feet long. So, you know, the, the tip is about three feet. So you got that on each side, but there's really not a lot of wing there. It's not a big airplane at all. And then they've got this big, huge engine on there and it weighs like 2,400 pounds. And, you know, when you, when you see it, it just looks wrong and it looks like it would come apart, but really the fuselage is only there to steer the engine and the guns. So really, the fuselage bolted on the back of the engine and just is along for the ride, basically. Next. 
So here's a little shot, um, basically from the firewall to the back of the propeller area is about eight feet. And so there's a lot of engine there. Um, you know, it's, it's a big thing. Now, the, the Germans gave a lot of thought to servicing the aircraft. Uh, the clamshell, clamshell cowling doors, basically there's a quick release pin at the front and at the back. And so two people could take the cowling, you know, the top slash side cowlings off the 109 in about three minutes. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever seen them uncowling a Spitfire or something like that. Um, it takes a long, long time to get the cowlings off. And the lower cowling has the engine oil cooler in it, so it's not sort of field removable easily, uh, but it does swing down out of the way, as you see it right here. So the Germans put a lot of thought into maintaining the aircraft engine and systems uh, as easily as it could be fixed. Next. Fuel injection. Right from the time they started building the 109, the engines were fuel injected. And, you know, we don't even hardly give it a second thought nowadays. You know, you're driving around, you know, the odd time you'll get a, a what, a, an older car, a vintage car pass you and you smell all that raw fuel and everything that you're not used to smelling anymore because of the fuel injection. So the Germans were doing fuel injection back in 1935 and it worked very well. And this happens to be one off the Dahmer Benz inverted V12 engine that the 109 actually runs now. And uh, it's quite a piece of engineering. Next, superchargers. The, the Germans were big on superchargers. This is actually a late war supercharger. It's kind of like Binford size, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but, you know, they, they, they really improved the power of their product as time went on. Next. Um, this is uh, on the, on the left-hand side is actually uh, sort of a sectional view of the supercharger. What's really interesting is you get to the sort of the center part there where the red is. And the, the Germans came up with a variable ratio drive for the supercharger. And it was actually completely controlled by the systems on the engine. So I would imagine, you know, density, altitude, things like that. It was adjusting for that at all times. And so the pilot could, you know, actually pay attention to their primary job, which was making it back home and doing some damage while they're out there. Um, if we compare this to, um, let's say, a Spitfire with a two-speed, um, two-stage supercharger, Basically, the pilot had to shift the supercharger when they were at an altitude that would allow them to run the supercharger at that ratio. So as you went up higher, you, of course, could increase the speed of the supercharger because the air was thinner. So when you're actually descending, you actually have to do everything in reverse or you'll overboost the engine, which, you know, could be catastrophic. And then on the German aircraft, it was all done automatically for you. Next. Uh, engine electrical wiring harness. Uh, you can see the plugs there sort of at the end of those wires. The engines came pre-wired from the factory. Uh, when you were gonna do an engine change, all you had to do was unplug these plugs and you didn't have little terminals to take off or anything. You, you know, you just basically pull the plugs out and uh, the engine mounts were quick release. All of the engine controls that were tied, you know, to the cockpit or whatever, were all quick disconnect. So, you know, uh, you could change an engine in pretty short order in a 109 where it would take you days, a P-51 or a Spitfire to do that. Interestingly enough, also the various plugs all have a different number of male pins in them. And so you cannot put the wrong plug in the wrong receptacle because the pins will not allow you to do that. So they only go in one place. So theoretically you could do it in the dark. Next, 
pressure refueling. The Germans had a system, you know, most, most aircraft, especially at that time, were all gravity refueled, right? I mean, you're pumping fuel in it, but it's basically, you know, going in the funnel apparatus and it's going down in the tank. The Germans just, you know, they had a vent line hooked in there at the top of the tank. And so what they did is they could pump in fuel in there really quickly. And when the tank was full, it would just blow fuel out of the, the hose where this gentleman's holding it right now. So they could refuel that aircraft very quickly. Next. Um, you know, here you hear all the hot rod kids talk about, uh, you know, NOS, nitrous oxide. Well, I got news for them. The mid-war, the Germans used nitrous oxide in their aircraft. They also used water methanol, and that's what this picture de uh, depicts. Uh, basically, on the right-hand side, that oval tank in the rear of the fuselage had water methanol in it. And so when the pilot armed the system, uh, he could actually, you know, it, it, it it put a mist of it into the intake of the supercharger and of course distributed to the cylinders, et cetera. Um, the Germans had problems with the octane in fuel. And so, you know, trying to crank all the horsepower they could out of these engines, they soon ran into problems with detonation and, you know, detonation in, in a large amount is very destructive on the engine. So one of the things they did is used water methanol, which would actually, it, it does cool the intake charge, so they get more bang in there, um, but it also delays the onset of detonation. And so they could crank more performance out of the engines, especially at altitude. Um, and, you know, that was kind of the get out of Dodge feature if you needed to. Uh, you just put everything into the firewall and go as hard and fast as you possibly can. Next. And this is actually a K model. Um, so that was the last model of 109 that was built, the K4s. And, you know, these engines with water methanol, et cetera, were close to 2,000 horsepower. And, you know, little dinky airplane, uh, it went pretty good. And so uh, straight and level, they could do about 420 miles an hour. And, of course, at altitude or diving, they could do a lot more. And I think the next one is close to our last slide. And that's actually my 109, which, um, you know, I had the jig and I had a lot of parts and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I got busy and thought, well, I may as well build my own. So whether that was a bright idea or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but I guess that's for a discussion another time. And... I think that's the last slide. Yes, that's the last slide. 